the worst thing you can do though is not manage temperature uh, post arrest. There's not a single trial out there that shows that doing nothing in terms of temperature management is safe. This is Nicole Kupchik and welcome to 10 Minute Tidbits. Today I'm here with Nick Johnson and we are going to chat about targeted temperature management. So we are going to rehash, I know, I know I've done episodes on this before, but there's new information that's been published in the last year. So we're going to rehash the 33 versus 36 degrees post cardiac arrest. All right, are we ready, Nick? Let's do it. All right, okay. So a lot of you know, back in 2002, there were two papers published demonstrating when you use 32 to 34 degrees post arrest versus not controlling temperature at all, there was a benefit, mm -hmm. okay? And that was studied in uh, shockable rhythm, so pulses VTAC, VFib. All right, so we knew there was some benefit there. And then in 2013, Dr. Nielsen et al. out of um, Europe published a paper uh, evaluating 33 versus 36 degrees. And what did they find? So they found actually no difference in their primary outcome of mortality at 90 days, uh, which was a little bit surprising. But yeah. I think there have been a lot of skeptical people about targeted temperature yeah. management anyway. Um, I think the crazy thing after this paper is that there was pretty widespread and really rapid uh, practice adoption of this 36 uh, degree yes. goal. Um, and we've seen that in the literature, but we also saw it locally at, at our institution where we almost immediately switched to 36 degrees. Yeah, I, well, and I think people just want to do the latest, greatest, or there were a lot of naysayers to be quite frankly right. honest. But I have to say one big major, I think, uh, protocol uh, element in Nielsen's study was that they rewarmed the 33 group over on average about six hours. Right. And that's a rapid rewarm. It's a pretty fast rewarm, and I think the other criticism of that trial is that the time to target temperature uh, to target temperature was quite long, mm -hmm. uh, and there has been some data since that time that has shown that time to target temperature might be important. So those okay. are the two biggest criticisms that you'll see of that big TTM trial. But otherwise, it was a pretty well done, pretty large study. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, almost a thousand patients, nine hundred and I think eighty-five. I want to say, but okay. All right. So since then, what's happened? Well, a lot of facilities, like you said, have gone to thirty-six degrees. And what's happening now? Well, they're starting to look at their outcome data. Yeah. Okay. So there was a paper published by the original Australian group that did the um, the uh, thirty-three versus. Um, no uh, temperature management at all. So that was published in 2002. So that was Dr. Bernard and Janet Bray. So right. they published their outcome data. Yeah. Which was interesting. <laughs> yeah, so they looked at a relatively small number of patients. I think it was about 76 patients uh, in their shockable rhythm only group. And they found that there were a couple of big process measures that sort of were an issue after they switched from 36 to 30, uh, 33 to 36 yeah. degrees. Um, one of them was that there was a lot less active temperature management that was started yes. in the ED. Uh, that's not that surprising because a lot of patients who come in after cardiac arrest come in around 36 degrees or yeah. a little bit, bit below it. So people might assume that they're close enough to the goal, so we don't need to manage temperature yes. actively anyway. The problem with that is they also documented about a 20% incidence of early fever. Um, and we know that fever after any type of brain injury, and especially cardiac arrest, is potentially harmful. Yeah. They showed that there is a trend toward worse mortality in the 36 degree group, but didn't actually have enough patients in the study to show that this was statistically significant. So pretty concerning about some process issues, not sure if the, the change actually led to yeah. any real clinical outcome differences. Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest things we're seeing um, in a lot of centers is compliance is a huge issue. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like 36 degrees, ah, no big deal, let the ICU deal with it. In the meantime, the patient's getting febrile. Yep. Okay, that's a problem. Okay, so then the New Zealand Australian Consortium Group mm -hmm. published kind of their registry and evaluating the 33 versus going to 36 degrees. And what did they find? Yes, yeah, so this was a big paper published in yes. Critical Care Medicine. The lead author is Salter, but Paul Young is sort of the senior author in that group. Uh, and they found what the rest of the world found, which is that this new study led to really rapid adoption of the 36 degree yeah. goal. And they looked at average temperatures in over 9,000 patients in this big uh, registry and found that the average temperature jumped up really acutely after the TTM trial was published by about a degree. Um, they also found that over that time period, uh, mortality for cardiac arrest in Australia and New Zealand had been improving pretty significantly. Yeah. And the change of slope of that curve of improval 
uh, abruptly changed around the time the TTM trial was published. Yeah, I've put that graph in a lot of um, presentations I've done, but you can see like it was, um, oh God, what year was it? 2005 uh, to 2013, I think mm -hmm. it was. You could see this mortality is declining. And then when 36 degrees got implemented, the mortality yeah, starts, going, starts up. going up. Again. Like, whoa, guys. So, I, so what do you do with this, right? I mean, yeah. I think it's hard to say exactly what to yeah. do with this. It could be that there's been something else that's changed in cardiac arrest care. It could be that our patients are changing. Uh, fewer people are having primary cardiac events and more, more okay. people are having things like heroin overdoses that we know lead to poor outcomes after yeah. cardiac arrest. Um, it could be that our practices have changed in some other way. Maybe we're getting more cynical and withdrawing life-sustaining therapy earlier for cardiac arrest patients than we used to. But it also could be that we're not doing targeted temperature management as well or at all at 36 degrees. Um, and because we're letting patients become hyperthermic or febrile, we're contributing to more secondary brain injury. Yeah. Patients are actually having a worse outcome. And I think the last possibility is that there was something actually wrong in the TTM trial um, and 33 is actually better biologically than 36 degrees. I don't think that's probably the case, but we'll know a little bit more about that question when the TTM2 trial comes out, uh, which compares 33 degrees to controlled normothermia at 37 degrees. Uh, they're enrolling patients now. Yeah, I don't, and I'm, I'm just, I'm still skeptical as to whether we'll have an answer from that, that trial. I don't know. I, ugh, you know, well, one good thing though, they were, because we, so at Miami, chilling at the beach last year, mm -hmm. and I did a YouTube on this, we asked the, the study group, you know, how quickly are you going to rewarm the 33 group? And they were like, oh, six hours. And we're like, don't do that! We're yeah, like, you know, slow, to, slow it down. And they actually changed their protocol. That's great. Yeah, so yeah. I looked at their protocol last fall, and they had actually updated their protocol, and they're going to rewarm more slowly. So I think at least it takes that you know, kind of doubt out of the equation. Yeah, and having been involved in some of these big trials now, these trials are hard to do. Oh yeah, uh, they're expensive. A lot, of, a lot of details, a lot of expense, yeah. a lot of resources, and so um, I'm glad they're doing it, And I, but I fully uh, appreciate all the complexities that go into conducting these big trials and how the results of those big trials may not play out in real life uh, to be, because all the things we do to make sure people adhere to these protocols and trials are hard to do in the real clinical yeah. setting. Well, and I think one of the biggest things I noticed just clinically at the bedside is shivering mm -hmm. is really difficult to manage at 36 degrees. I don't know. I just felt like at 30 three degrees, you kind of get below a threshold where patients just don't shiver as much. But I found at 36 degrees, I gave a heck of a lot of medication. Yeah. So that was one yeah. of the big concerns that we had uh, when we made the protocol change at Harborview uh, was that patients were maybe getting more sedation, more neuromuscular blockade to maintain at 36 degrees. Yeah. And maybe that was confounding our ability to prognosticate on the back end. Um, we actually, in some QI efforts, showed that patients were getting more sedation at 36 mm -hmm. degrees, and a couple other centers have reported this too. There are some reports on the other side, though, showing that patients get more sedation at 33 degrees. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. One of the things that we did in a recent protocol change where we actually went back to 33 degrees is we changed how we give sedation during targeted temperature management. Okay. We used to give deep sedation and neuromuscular blockade to pretty much everybody. Um, now we do it on an as-needed basis using a uh, shivering assessment tool called the BSAS, Bedside Shivering Assessment Scale. And we allow our nurses to really judge how much shivering the patient is having, how much heat generation is there in your temperature management device, and give sedation as needed based mm -hmm. on how much heat the patient's generating, and also what their other needs are in terms of analgesia and sedation. Yeah, and then you also used some different medications, right? You started using more magnesium. Yep. Uh, IV Tylenol, yes. magnesium. Uh, we use dexmedetomidine and yeah. fentanyl infusions before we go to the big guns like propofol and midazolam. Um, mm -hmm. And then at uh, the, the bottom of the tier is cisatricuria. Yeah. And there is some thought that maybe propofol is, might be harmful to cardiac arrest patients. Right? Yeah. Graham Nichol is talking about this quite a bit. Yeah. There's some uh, interesting animal data out there with really high dose propofol and ischemia reperfusion injury that I think is hypothesis generating but needs a lot more study. Sure. We're still using yeah. propofol. Um, Pretty routinely in our ICU and cardiac arrest patients, but it is uh, some interesting uh, animal data. Yeah. So, so I. So, what what do people? What do the listeners do from here? What do you do? I don't know. I think first of all, if you went to thirty six, track your data, right? Absolutely. And then and find like I would look at compliance mm -hmm. personally. Like if I was at an institution that was using thirty six, I would definitely look at compliance in the ED. Yep. Make sure it's being carried through to the cath lab yep. and then up to the ICU. What else would you recommend? Yeah, I think you have really two choices. If you're doing 36, you need to make sure you're doing 36 really well okay. and that you're actively managing patients' temperatures from the time they arrive in the hospital because that's what they did in the trial. Um, I think it's reasonable to stay at 33. Um, in the big TTM trial, there were some minor differences in adverse events between the groups, electrolyte abnormalities and a slightly higher pressure requirement, but no major differences. Okay. So I think at the very least, we know that 33 is probably safe. 
So I think 33 is fine or a really good 36 is fine until we have a little bit more data. Yeah, and then again, I think just staying on top of the shivering is, is absolutely key at 36 degrees. And then the other thing is preventing fever for the following, the days following uh, when you get back to your kind of normal, more normal temperature. Just absolutely. fever avoidance for at least 72 hours. Yep. Yeah, and our protocol has 48 hours after the initial 24-hour hypothermia period of strict normothermia. Yeah, so, all right, key things. So let us know if you have any questions, but I think, you know, I think uh, it's it's interesting. It's Things have really changed in resuscitation, uh, but yet they haven't. It's right. like some yeah. things change and some things don't. And, um, but again, um, I, I don't know. I think the worst thing you can do, though, is not manage temperature uh, post-arrest. That, that could be actually pretty harmful to patients. So. I think that's right. I think there are, there's not a single trial out there that shows that doing nothing in terms of temperature management is safe in this patient population. Yeah, so anyway. All right. So um, we'd love any questions you've got, but I'm Nicole Kupchik. This is Nick Johnson. And this is 10-Minute Tidbits. <laughs>